G'day. <laughs> My name's Sarah Barker. I'm from Australia. Um, I am a uh, special counsel at. That's my one for the disclosure panel. No, I know. Uh, yeah, I didn't try to put that up. Sorry. Just go ahead. I tell you, I tell you, it's not my strong point. Yeah, no. Um, I am a, a special counsel at Minter Ellison Lawyers. We're the largest commercial law firm in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we are very much a what I think uh, Joanne called last night a white shoe practice. Does that mean something over here? Mm. We're a defendant practice. We act for um, big, nasty corporations and their big, nasty directors. Um, and I'm also a pension fund trustee director on uh, the board of one of Australia's largest pension funds, the Emergency Services and State Superannuation Fund. And it is my pleasure to be chairing the panel on my favourite topic which is directors' duties and liability in relation to climate change risks. So today I'm very excited uh, about the panel that we have to share their complementary perspectives on this topic. And I'll, I'll briefly introduce them before I, I say a few opening remarks about the topic and, and then hand over to them for their opening statements before we open it up to the discussion. So to my right, we have Kristen Casper who is uh, an attorney from Greenpeace in, in Canada. Kristen uh, creates the law, basically. If we didn't have people like Kristen um, actually uh, acting on the legal theory and bringing corporations and directors to account, then we wouldn't have any scary examples to talk to directors about. So thank you, Kristen. <laughs> then I have Andrew McDougall, who is a corporate law partner who specialise in corporate, specialises in corporate governance, securities law, disclosure and shareholder um, activism at Osla Hoskin and Harcourt. And uh, David is going to, uh, sorry, Andrew is going to talk to us today about director's duties through and disclosure obligations through that, that corporate law lens. And then finally, to my very right, we have David Estrin, who, in a nutshell, is a giant in the environmental law field in Canada and around the world. Um, he literally wrote the book on environmental law uh, and its implications for business, um, called The Business Guide to Environmental Law. <laughs> um, and amongst his many other um, current positions and previous experience, which I won't go into in detail, they're all, they're all in the packs before you. Um, he's currently heading up the International Bar Association subcommittee that um, recently wrote uh, a report entitled Achieving Justice and Human Rights in an Era of Climate Disruption. So I think we've got three really good complementary perspectives on this question today. We're gonna to start with, with Kristen talking about um, litigation all around the globe in relation to climate risk and the different categories of climate litigation uh, that we're currently seeing. We'll then move on to um, Andrew to talk, oh, sorry, we're gonna to move on to you then, David, um, to talk about uh, perspectives on director liability under environmental law in Ontario. And then finally, bringing up uh, the rear with Andrew to talk about um, duties and disclosure obligations through a corporate and securities law lens. So very briefly before I hand over to Kristen, I wanted to talk about an F word, which I think is, is, is the centre of this panel today, and that F word is fiduciary. Mm. So one um, phrase that tends to be thrown around by directors and their advisors, usually as a blocking mechanism when they don't want to do something, is this concept of fiduciary duty thrown around all the time, but it's not really well understood. What does it mean? Well, at its base, being a fiduciary means to undertake to act in someone else's best interests and to prioritise someone else's best interests above your own interests and the interests of any other third party. And directors are fiduciaries of their corporation. And pension fund trustees are fiduciaries of their beneficiaries. So they undertake to prioritise the interests of, of either the corporation or the beneficiaries. And for 30 years 
when we look at climate change and its relationship to directors' duties, the focus of the debate has been around, well, can directors even think about climate change because best interests are making money for corporations and climate change is a non-financial, ethical, environmental, lefty greeny hippie issue that is fundamentally inconsistent with making money. So for the longest time, the debate has been around whether or not it is even in the best interest for a corporation to be thinking about climate change. Mm. Now, after Ben's keynote this morning, I'm sure um, you have a, a much better sense of the fact that that is not the case anymore. There are significant physical risks and economic transition risks associated with climate change that are materially financial and that manifest within mainstream business horizons. This is not something that we can think about in 2070 or 2100, something that we need to think about now. So that being the case, the question is now evolving to, okay, well, if business is allowed to think about climate change because it's financial, what does it have to do? And what do, what do directors need to think about when they are considering the impact of climate risk on their business? And that's where I think the direction of the debate is heading now, around the second half of a fiduciary duty in relation to minimum standards of competence, due care and diligence. How does a director exercise due care and diligence in acting in the best interests of its corporation in relation to climate change? And that's where we really do need, as lawyers, to be working with the economists and the financial institutions and the scientists and those clever software engineering people that do all the big data. Because to exercise due care and diligence in relation to this issue, you've got to be current. Mm. And it's not about what you do know, but what you ought to know. So with that uh, preface to my take on the F word, I'm going to hand over to Kristen to talk about um, the different categories of climate litigation that we're seeing around the world at the moment, and it's very exciting. <laughs> I know I need to get out more, but it's really exciting. There it is. Great. Well, thank you for that brilliant introduction. And um, first, I just want to thank uh, one of the key organizers of this event, Professor Williams. You've done a great job bringing together um, a, a, an excellent group. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you, well, first, let me just say, um, I am not a Canadian lawyer. I'm a U.S. lawyer, and as Sarah says, my, my role in all of this is working around the world, around the globe, um, creating, developing, and supporting climate litigation. So I hope that this, this morning talk will set kind of the mood music, then for my co-panelists to come in and really bring in the Canadian aspects of fiduciary duty, Canadian governments, uh, governance, and the director's risk. So, Two things happened in 2013 that I think changed the course of history on climate action. A major super typhoon hit the Philippines, killing 6,300 people and leaving millions affected even to this day. Second, a groundbreaking report came out that showed just 90 carbon producers, called the carbon majors, were responsible for 63% of the estimated global emissions of CO2 and methane. In response to these developments, Greenpeace and some allies sent some letters to fossil fuel companies and insurers and asked a simple question. What would they do if companies were sued over their history of funding climate misinformation and opposition to policies to fight climate change? Let's just say the response was pretty much silent. We were laughed at. The, the, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers brushed the letters off as a stunt. Uh, one editorial board here in, in, in Calgary said it was reckless and laughable to be making a comparison to big tobacco. But as my colleague Keith Stewart over there wrote in a recent blog, 
what the laughter is, uh, the laughter is now turning to silence because we're seeing climate change really happening. There is a mosaic of cases, and soon there will be a cascade of decisions. Columbia, um, the United Nations Environmental Program and Columbia Law School's Sabin Center for Climate Change Law recently produced a global survey of climate litigation. And they found that litigation has arguably never been a more important tool to push policymakers and market participants to develop and implement means of climate change mitigation and adaptation. So what's happening? There's 250 climate cases happening in 25 jurisdictions. And that's not including the 600 plus cases in the United States. And what, what we now have is we're looking, there's, there's uh, scholars and practitioners like Sarah Barker and the Two Degree Investing Initiative that are starting to dig in. And they've just produced a must read report. So download it now. It's called Carbon Boomerang, Litigation Risk as a Driver and Consequence of the Energy Transition. It does a great job laying out how litigation the long tail of litigation has impacts across the board, whether it's costs, uh, potential fines or penalties, prosecution of executives. We could see value, uh, impacts on valuation and credit ratings, shareholder claims, and even bringing in new parties to the litigation and exclusions and, and, and disputes between insured and insur uh, in, insurer. So, Climate litigation is a material risk. And don't take my word for it. This is the 10K filing of Chevron that recently came out. Um, Chevron stated, in addition, increasing attention to climate change risk has resulted in increased possibility of governmental investigations and potentially private litigation against the company. So in my short time left with you today, I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind of climate litigation around the world. And then I'm gonna end with three recommendations or insights that hopefully will be discussed in this panel and maybe in the coffee breaks. So uh, that same report, the, the, the carbon, let me just go back to the same report, the carbon boomerang the litigation re report, has, does an excellent job categorizing litigation into three distinct categories. First are claims relating to the failure to mitigate. Second, claims relating to the failure to adapt. And the third is regulatory claims that come out of the transition, the energy transition. I am only gonna focus on the first two, but maybe we'll get into the third category in the Q&A because that's also really important. So failure to mitigate, let me just put this in context. We have all been witnessing and, and sadly clicking on, uh, you know, looking at the news, and Sarah, I hope you're keeping time on me. I am. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> that there is, and keep me accountable, please. Uh, the flooding in South Asia, the fires in Western Canada and the Western United States, Hurricane Harvey, Irma, Maria, devastating the Caribbean and parts of the Southeastern United States. And scientists are in a broad agreement that hurricanes like Irma are intensified by climate change and climate change is increasing the risk of deadly and destructive fires. The costs are astronomical, and the unofficial cost of Irma and Harvey and Irma and Maria combined is 300 billion US. And just two of BC's wildfires, so the Elephant Hill and the Williams Lake fire, cost insurance insurers approximately 127 million Canadian dollars. And that doesn't include all the businesses and homes and possessions that are uninsured. So this is a billboard that went up in Houston, I think last week, it has a question on it. People are starting to ask, who's gonna pay for all the damages? And some are suggesting that the big fossil fuel companies that have contributed a disproportionate amount of the greenhouse climate pollution um, and that have undermined climate science and action and solutions should make a significant contribution um, to, to the cost of resiliency and adaptation. There's also science that has come out. UCS, UCS, Union Concerned Scientists, University of Oxford, the Climate Accountability Institute, produced a study looking at those carbon major companies. And they found that nearly 50% of the global average rise in temperature since 1880, and 30% of the global sea level rise since 1880 can be attributed to these companies' emissions. I mean, it makes me wanna ask, if that extra carbon had not been added to the atmosphere, would we be facing the climate-driven disasters we are today? So what is happening in response? Well, 
three communities, uh, the County of San Mateo, the City of Imperial Beach, the County of Marin, have filed a case against 37 carbon producers. Um, it's under various causes, causes of action, including public nuisance, strict liability, um, design defect, and many others. So various causes of action. And the cost, the damages that they are looking at, for example, San Mateo is expecting $39 billion in property damage over uh, the next period of time. Um, the response has been quick. The companies have moved, uh, filed notice to remove the cases from state court to federal dis district court, and it's expected that they will be filing a motion to dismiss um, at the appropriate time. Those municipalities were also joined by San Francisco and Oakland, but this time the case is a bit different. It's a bit more targeted. It's looking at only five, the five largest investor-owned carbon producers, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, BP, Royal Dutch Shell, and they are arguing that the defendants, the corporations, knowingly and recklessly created a public nuisance that has led to a present harm and a risk of future harm to health, human health, and property. Again, we're talking billions. San Francisco, we all know that incredibly rich city, you know, they're, they're facing at least 10 billion in public and 39 billion in private property risk alone. Now I'm gonna take you to probably where my heart is and on the other side of the world. Um, those same people who, some of the people that survived Typhoon Haiyan, along with NGOs and um, notable individuals, filed the first ever petition to a Commission on Human Rights seeking an investigation into the responsibility of the carbon producers for climate-related human rights harms. So the, the case is based on, on international law and national law, um, and that the petitioners argue that these companies are not fulfilling their responsibility um, to respect human rights through the extraction, production, and sale of products that, when used as directed, result in significant climate change pollution and resulting human rights impacts. They argue that these companies are, are acting without due diligence in light of the known risks posed by climate change. Just two days ago, uh, the Commission on Human Rights issued a notice to all of the companies asking them to appear at a preliminary conference on December 11th in Manila. That's the day after International Human Rights Day. Um, but let's say they haven't been so active yet. Only 21 of the 47 companies even bothered to respond to the petition. Um, this, it does include some of the major companies like Exxon, but the Canadian companies have been silent. So the question is, will these companies show corporate good, good corporate citizenship, um, we'll have to see. So I'm gonna move quickly. There are also cases against governments that are happening, a successful one in the Netherlands that got increased the ambition um, in its national climate policies that is on appeal. We're seeing grandmothers taking on the Swiss government. This case not only involves just the power sector, but is also looking at uh, the transport and building sector emissions. Norwegian youth, now this is important for companies that are seeking to uh, extract new or to have new fossil fuel projects. So Norwegian youth and Greenpeace Nordic have sued the Norwegian government <coughs> seeking to invalidate uh, license, licensings granted to multinational companies to drill based on the constitutional right to a healthy environment. So just quickly, I feel like I need more time, but I'm gonna do this as quick as possible. The failure to adapt cases, and these are probably the ones that everyone in this room is thinking about. The attorneys general in the United States, two of them in particular, New York and Massachusetts, are investigating Exxon um, for what they know, knew about climate change and what they did with, uh, about climate change, looking at whether there's been some sort of fraud underneath the Martin Act and potentially the consumer protection laws. Um, What's interesting about this case is that it does have ties here in Canada. An employee of Imperial, um, a subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary of ExxonMobil, has been asked to testify about whether he was asked not to apply carbon pricing when looking at assets in the tar sands. So very important, important uh, uh, decision and, and case and investigation to look at. But there's been leaders, financial firms like Black, BlackRock and Vanguard have really pushed ExxonMobil through shareholder resolutions to ask for more of a clear assessment on how climate change commitments and action 
impacts the business operations and business plans. There are also shareholders that are moving in here. So there's a class action lawsuit um, in the United States brought against not just ExxonMobil, but four of its former and current um, officers looking at whether Exxon produced misleading and or materially false public statements in failing to disclose climate change litigation, uh, climate risks in its internal reports. Um, and the, essentially what they're saying is that they believe that there, the stocks were artificially inflated, um, stock pricing was artificially inflated. And then in Australia, we saw a very interesting legal action, once again, by two uh, shareholders saying that Commonwealth Bank, an investor that had potentially investing in a very controversial mine, the Andani Carmichael mine, whether they had included climate risks, sufficiently disclosed climate risk. The case was ultimately um, ended because uh, Commonwealth Bank did produce, a, in September 2017, a report that included uh, climate change, looking at climate change risks, and also committed to undertaking a scenario analysis. Um, and I'm missing something here, but that's okay. Uh, just very quickly, also here in Canada, we're seeing NGOs like Greenpeace Canada looking at IPOs um, that are being issued in, and asking whether climate change risks have been sufficiently considered in those. So Kinder Morgan had an IPO out. Uh, the Greenpeace Canada went, submitted a complaint to the Alber Alberta Securities um, Regulator and just said that, you know, the out-of-date oil demand productions were overly optimistic, um, that the international market, uh, oil market had changed. So they, they listed these issues. Um, ultimately, the IPO was put out again um, and moved forward, but it had, it had changed in response to this complaint. So finally, I just want to end with three recommendations. And um, the first one is just that deadlines focus the mind. So anyone in this room that is working with companies that are, that are named in the Philippines petition, for example, ask them to show up to be there at that investigation and to talk about the risks associated with climate change. December 11th is an important date, and so I hope that that is communicated to these companies. Second, honesty is the best policy. And what I mean here is that we hope that there is wide support for companies um, in, in supporting securities regulators and establishing requirements for mandatory disclosure of climate-related li risks and opportunities. Um, just the other day, actually yesterday, Greenpeace Canada filed a uh, application for review for the need of a new policy or regulation for mandatory corporate disclosures of climate-related risks and opportunities. This is underneath the Environmental Bill of Rights, so please come and talk to us. This is a new action I think is particularly relevant for all of us in the room. And then third, I think that the, the big thing here is that people can act now directors and officers can act now or get sued later. Um, and the best and most important thing to do is to start thinking about how business models can be aligned with a world where temperature rise is kept to 1.5 C. So thank you so much. We'll take questions at the end um, rather than after each speaker. So David, I'll invite you to the podium. It's going to be difficult because I don't have the PowerPoints in front of me, but um, maybe, I don't know, can I stand over here? Oh, no. Okay, I can see them over there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Hi. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Cynthia and, and, uh, and Ivy Foundation for undertaking this uh, significant and important uh, project. I'm pleased that I've had an opportunity to be uh, involved to some peripheral extent. and. Um, Pleased to be here today. It's amazing, amazing coincidence to be here with Sarah, who we were just on a panel together last week <laughs> in Sydney, uh, talking about, uh, in general terms, the same topic, and um, and with Kristen and with Andrew. So, um, climate change, directors and officers, statutory duties and liabilities under environmental law. Let's. This is Ontario. Ontario has this provision in its Environmental Protection Act. Every director or officer, you can read it, I hope, from there, has a duty to take all reasonable care to prevent the corporation from causing or permitting the discharge of a contaminant in contravention of this act or the regulations. So that's a positive duty. 
Secondly, we go to Section 14 of the Environmental Protection Act, which says, despite any other provision of the act or the regulation, a person shall not discharge a contaminant or permit its discharge if it may cause an adverse effect. What is an adverse effect defined as? Everything that climate change can do. Impairment of the quality of the natural environment for any use that can be made of it. Injury or damage to property or to plant or animal life. Harm and material discomfort to people. Impairment of the safety of people. Rendering property or plant or animal life unfit for human use. Loss of enjoyment and normal use of property and interference with the normal use of business. In other words, there is a clear uh, uh, provision in Ontario law that says, despite whatever permanent approval you have, you can't do this. And with section, one, uh, with section 194, directors and officers have a duty to prevent that from happening. Now, um, beyond that, there's an onus on directors under the EPA. If a director or officer of a corporation is charged with an offense under that section, uh, the director or officer has the onus in the trial of the offense of proving that he or she carried out the duty in connection with the contravention. So that's making it pretty clear that there is a duty. And under the next subheading, a director officer of a corporation is liable to conviction under this section whether or not the corporation has been prosecuted or convicted. Um, and then what are some of the penalties? Well, uh, depending on the, if, if in fact emissions actually are, are getting out there, the penalties can be substantial, not less than $5,000 and not more than $4 million on a first conviction, not less than $10,000 and not more than $6 million on a second conviction, et cetera, et cetera, and to imprisonment, et cetera. And then beyond that, a court who convicts somebody of this offense can make an order that is in the nature of an injunction, a prohibition saying, don't do that again, and don't allow this to occur again, Mr. Ms. Director. And if you do, you'll be in contempt of court. So that's Ontario law, I think, that has to be taken into account in this area. Now let's turn to federal law. So we have the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, 1999. Before we get into it, I just want to give you a quote from a recent uh, federal court decision, what the court had found in a case that Syncrude took to attack federal regulations about climate change. The court said, the evil of global climate change and the apprehension of harm resulting from an en enabling of climate change through the combustion of fossil fuels has been widely discussed. Contrary to Sincrude's submission, there, this is a real, measured evil, and the harm has been well documented. It's a pretty clear statement, and I think it puts into context uh, where we are, why we're talking about this. So under the SEPA, um, the government can add substance to the toxic substances list if it's determined that the substance is entering or may enter the environment in a quantity or concentration uh, that may have an immediate or long-term harmful effect on the environment or its biological diversity, or may constitute a danger to the environment on which life depends, or may constitute a danger in Canada to human life or health. Well, guess what? In November 2006, three of the major greenhouse gases, CO2, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide, were all added to the toxic substances list. Now, let's look at the duties of directors and officers under SEPA 1999. Every director and officer of a corporation shall take all reasonable care to ensure that the corporation complies with this act and the regulations and orders and directions of the ministry. And uh, duties, uh, and there's big penalties if that's not given proper regard. And if there's a further section that makes clear that uh, officers and directors can be charged with as a party to an offense by a corporation as well, re regardless of whether or not the corporation has been prosecuted or convicted. And finally, there's a provision that if a corporation is convicted of an offense under SEPA, shareholders must be notified of the commission of the offense and of the details of the punishment imposed. So all of that has potential implications, not only for directors, but for the uh, reputational uh, risks and values of the corporation. Um, so let's turn to the last part of this. What is all reasonable care? Well, I'm going to paraphrase a, a quote from a case that was in uh, uh, Janice Sarah's paper. The standard of reasonable care involves a proportionality test assessing the risks involved, potential harm, potential benefit, and whether the level of sophistication of the system and its continual monitoring are reasonable given the activity sought to be registered. Well, um, as, as uh, 
we heard from Ben Caldicott, it's clear the risks are there. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made that perfectly clear. Ben's work is showing that it's perfectly clear. And uh, here's a quote from uh, the Bloomberg Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Recent years, just came out a couple of months ago, recent years have seen an increase in climate-related litigation claims being brought. Kristen talked about these. Reasons for such litigation include the failure of organizations to mitigate impacts of climate change, failure to adapt, and the insufficiency of disclosure around financial risks, material financial risks. As the value of loss and damage arising from climate change grows, litigation risk is also likely to increase. So what, again, and dealing with the question, what is all reasonable care? For those who lose money, investments, property, livelihood, or lives due to hazards of climate change, the focus will be on those major corporations that extracted GHG or produced GHG emitting products, those financial institutions that financed such activities, even if such activities were at that time, quote, legal, unquote, and also on the responsibility of directors and officers of operators and financial enablers. As, as noted by the Bloomberg TCFD report, there is increased risk that corporations which finance uh, as well as those which operate major GHG emitting activities will be targeted for climate related damages and there may well be statutory and civil liability. Why? Well, as stated above, they didn't do what they need to do to comply with what is reasonable care. They didn't take into account the significant risks that adding more GHGs uh, can, can cause, even if it's only a proportion of everything that's out there. They didn't assess the risk, they didn't look at the harm, and they didn't take reasonable steps. Um, so what could reasonable care, all reasonable care mean in generic terms? So it could mean that no new major GHG emission sources be operated or built except in exigent circumstances and where there is no alternative. And it could mean there is a duty on corporations and their directors who do not wish to be implicated in or found legally responsible for climate-related environmental and human rights evils, to use the word of the federal court, and impacts to refrain from author authorizing or financing them. This is what all reasonable care could arguably mean. And just to conclude, I want to uh, refer you before, uh, a couple of quotes from the Oslo Principles, which came out a couple of years ago, a group of experts in international law, human rights, and uh, uh, came together, articulated these principles, one of which says, it's based on these three key points. Avoiding severe global catastrophe is a moral and legal imperative to the extent that human activity endangers the biosphere particularly through the effects of human activity on the global climate, all states and enterprises, that means companies, have an immediate moral and legal duty to prevent the deleterious effect of climate change. The and, and they said, while all people can contribute, the primary legal responsibility rests with states and enterprises. And they also said, no single source of law alone requires states and enterprises to fulfill these principles. Rather, a network of intersecting um, Sources provide states and enterprises with obligations to respond urgently and effectively to climate change in a manner that respects, protects, and fulfills the basic dignity and human rights of the world's people and safety and integrity of the biosphere. So, I mean, you know, think about this. You, you're going to defend what you didn't do, and you've got faced with uh, these conclusions that have been articulated two years ago. Um, and, um, and, and they basically concluded all states and enterprises must reduce their GHG emissions to the extent that they can achieve such reduction without relevant additional cost. And states and enterprises must refrain from starting new activities that cause excessive GHG emissions, including, for example, erecting or expanding coal-fired power plants without, without taking countervailing measures unless the relevant activities can be shown to be indispensable. That's, that's what's stated there. Um, let me end with a couple more slides. I think what we're seeing is carbon as um, a toxic substance. There's a need for carbon limits. There's a human right to a healthy environment. You put those two things together, it seems to me carbon is or will become a toxic substance. And in fact, under SEPA, it already is. <laughs> in future, carbon reserves may be regarded as toxic substances and would therefore need to remain embedded. 
except under these conditions uh, that there's ex exigent circumstances or local economies that absolutely need uh, some form of energy. You know what? This is, I don't think what, what's going to occur is any different than what happened in these slides, if you can see them. The one on the right is a proposed label to go on a gas pump handle, and it's being potentially implemented by Canadian municipalities. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for having me here today. I must say, after hearing from my co-panelists, I'm reminded of the quote that uneasy rests the head that wears a crown. And a little bit of unease is a good thing for a director if it provides motivation for action and dispels complacency. But if there's too much unease, well, remember that Damocles fled his seat to escape the perilous sword that hung by a slender thread above his head. And we still need talented individuals to serve as directors. So I think it's worth reviewing how corporate governance shapes expectations for the director's role, some of the limitations that exist under corporate law, and accountability for corporate disclosure under Canadian securities laws. And then I'd like to canvas some of the current imperatives for board consideration of climate change. So let's start with the director's fiduciary duty. At common law and by statute, it is a duty to act honestly and in good faith with a view to the best interests of the corporation and a duty to exercise the care, diligence, and skill that a reasonably prudent person would exercise in comparable circumstances. Directors cannot contract out of these duties. Indemnities, DNO insurance do not cover a breach of a director's fiduciary duties. The fiduciary duty is owed to the corporation. It's not owed to any particular stakeholder group. In particular, although shareholders exercise governance rights that are not afforded to other stakeholders in the corporation, it is the corporation's interests that are paramount. And in determining what is in the corporation's interests, directors may consider the interests of various stakeholders. However, directors must treat stakeholders affected by the corporation's actions fairly and equitably when addressing conflicting stakeholder interests. So far, so good. But then the Supreme Court of Canada modified the director fiduciary duty by saying that directors have a duty to act in the best interests of the corporation viewed as a good corporate citizen. And the effect of these additional words is unclear. It should encompass compliance with laws. But it also could extend into other aspects of citizenship. We just don't know. So another key concept at law in understanding directors' duties is the business judgment rule. Directors are expected to make decisions. And courts will defer to the board decisions when made in good faith and in the best interests of the corporation free from conflicts of interest, following reasonable investigation and consideration of alternatives, and within a range of alternatives. In short, if the board follows an appropriate process, the court will not second guess the board's determination. So in addition to liability for failing to comply with their fiduciary duty, directors can be personally liable under the oppression remedy in Canada. And the fundamental purpose of the oppression remedy is to protect the reasonable expectations of a security holder, creditor, director, or officer. Now I'd like to pause here to draw just a couple of points from all of that. First, the themes of reasonableness, fairness, and the importance of context underlie and inform both the fiduciary duty and the oppression remedy. These are important themes because they provide 
the balance at law needed to attract experienced and talented individuals to serve as directors, while at the same time holding those individuals to account when their actions fall below a standard of reasonability. But it's also worth noting that context and what is reasonable or fair can change and evolve to reflect changing societal norms. And that's important when considering what role directors should play in considering climate risk. As Sarah mentioned in her opening remarks, expected norms are changing. Second, the corporate statutes limit the range of potential claimants. Only the reasonable expectations of current and former directors and officers, security holders, and creditors are protected under the oppression remedy. And while other stakeholders might be able to get the leave of a court to bring an action in the name of and for the benefit of the corporation, practically speaking, that's very unlikely. So in summary, directors who fail to consider climate risk potentially could be held accountable for such failure under corporate law, but there are some hurdles to doing so. By contrast, misrepresentations in corporate disclosure under securities law is a much more important source of potential director liability. Kristen referenced several instances where companies have been challenged on the basis of their disclosure, and I'd like to turn there next. Under common law, there's potential liability in the event that a person makes a materially untrue statement, either knowingly or negligently, and someone relies upon it to their detriment. However, in the case of a shareholder class action, the need to prove the detrimental reliance by every shareholder in the class action makes the common law remedy impractical in Canada. In a public offering, though, there is no need to show a detrimental reliance. If there is a misrepresentation, then the purchaser has a remedy of rescission or damages. And as set out in the slide, to constitute a misrepresentation, there needs to be an untrue statement of a material fact or an omission of a material fact that is either required to be stated or is necessary to make a statement not misleading in the circumstances. However, most capital markets activity occurs in the secondary markets. And it's not surprising, therefore, that there are statutory civil remedies for misrepresentations in written and oral disclosure and for untimely disclosure. And these remedies also dispense with the need to prove reliance on the misrepresentation or untimely disclosure. But there are counterbalancing provisions which are intended to protect against frivolous lawsuits. For example, directors are entitled to a due diligence defense. And with respect to core documents, such as the annual and quarterly financial statements, management's discussion and analysis, proxy circulars, and material change reports, directors have the onus of showing that they were diligent. But for non-core documents and public oral statements, the plaintiff has the onus of showing that there was knowledge, willful blindness, or gross misconduct on the part of the director with respect to the misrepresentation. Other protections include the fact that the plaintiff needs the leave of a court to pursue an action. And finally, there are caps on liability in the event that a claim is successful. Now, we've had many conversations with our clients regarding environmental and climate change disclosure matters. At one point, the conversation involved the need for better internal oversight over the voluntary disclosure that the company provided on environmental matters. For example, one of our clients had the legal department and the financial department thoroughly reviewing their quarterly and annual management discussion analysis and financial statements, but those same individuals had no involvement whatsoever reviewing their annual report on, on ESG. And as a result, the language in the ESG report became somewhat promotional, and it just did not align well with the mandated disclosure under securities laws that the company was providing. Now, in case you're, you're wondering, well, the company has now changed its practice. But that was one example. We've also had conversations with our clients about the surveys that they're asked to complete, including those for the Carbon Disclosure Project and the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, among others. And a common complaint is that the level of detail required by these and other surveys is far too granular and time consuming. Some of our clients have cut back on the range of surveys that they're prepared to complete. Others have taken the approach with varying degrees of success 
of revising their ESG report to include as many commonly requested elements as possible so that they can simply cross-reference their ESG report when responding to the survey questions rather than having to set out the details in the response to the survey and so that they can be more consistent between the different surveys that they respond to. This year, as a result of the Climate Change Disclosure Review Program announced by the Canadian Securities Administrators in March, several of our clients were selected for review. And a common request was to explain why the level of detail included in the Carbon Disclosure Project survey responses was not reflected in their continuous disclosure filings. The answer, I'm going to cut to the chase here, by the way, was that the level of detail under the CDP survey was much more granular than the level of materiality that the client viewed as being what investors were looking for on the, on the subject. But I'm very eager to hear what Joanne Matier has to say about the review later this morning. I'm not aware of a civil action in Canada based on misrepresentations and disclosure as a result of climate change, but clients have nevertheless been considering their approach to disclosure on climate change matters. Before I conclude, I'd like to touch on what I see are the driving pressures for boardroom discussion of climate change. Physical impacts, which we heard about earlier today, are a key impetus. Extreme weather events can have a sudden and profound impact on operations of a business, both negative and positive. For example, in Texas, refining was hit hard by Hurricane Harvey. But I understand that construction is now doing a very brisk business. Rising temperatures can impact utility demands and challenge capacity or reduce demand for winter-based activities. Boards need to consider these impacts in assessing the corporation's risks, resiliency, and opportunities. The move to a less carbon-intensive environment threatens certain industries, but also increases opportunities in renewable resources. Changes to laws and regulations not only may constrain the corporation's ability to realize on its strategy, but may necessitate a change in strategic direction. Another impact is that investors are asking for more disclosure. And that is to enable the investors to make their own assessment of the corporation's performance and expectations for the future. And they're looking for it, whether in mandatory reports, voluntary ones, or consolidated scores generated from the databases that are filled with all those survey response data. We have assisted clients in conducting peer reviews to ensure whether their current approach in terms of disclosure is in line with market practice. And then in addition, ethical investors make investment decisions based on their assessment of the company's performance on ESG matters. And as Professor Williams alluded to this morning, uh, the Globe and Mail reported that the KESS is looking to make a 25% reduction in its carbon footprint of its portfolio. So these changes in investor focus, they can all have an impact on the company's cost of capital and its stock performance and its long-term prospects. These pressures have an immediate impact at the board level because reputational concerns are a key board focus. And while the focus of this panel is on the liability risks for directors, concern for the reputation of the company and of the directors on the board have a strong and, frankly, more immediate impact. Employees, especially younger ones, are much more sensitive to climate change issues. And companies with a poor reputation on climate change are finding it harder to attract talent. Laggards will also have more trouble attracting investor interest. And the pervasive influence of social media today can enhance or destroy a company's or a board's reputation, and it can do it far faster than any legal process. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before um, I throw open to the floor, I've got a couple of questions for the for the panelists myself. Um, I'm not going to dwell um, too much on um, the comments made in relation to the disclosure cases because I know the subject of the next panel is an entirely on disclosure, so I don't want to step on any toes there. Um, although suffice to say, interestingly, in the context of your your comments there at the end, Andrew, around the um, disparity between the voluntary disclosures on climate risk and 
the disclosures in the, in the mandatory financial filings. Last year in the UK, we actually had uh, Client Earth, Alexia's there from Client Earth, um, actually refer the financial statements of a number of um, upstream oil and gas exploration companies to the uh, Financial Reporting Council over there. Um, on the basis that in their uh, uh, CDP disclosures, their uh, uh, carbon disclosure project disclosures, they had listed um, particular issues associated with climate change as being material financial risks likely to manifest within five years, yet were completely silent in their mandatory yeah. filings in relation to that. So it, 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 I think certainly that is an area in which there is ripe for, um, for litigation. But the thing I did want to focus on myself is, is this concept of, of due diligence, because both in relation to the disclosure as aspects that, that, that were mentioned, um, and also in relation to the duty of directors to exercise that degree of due care and diligence as a reasonable director would in their, in their same circumstances. This issue of liability really turns on what a reasonable person would do in the circumstances. Reasonable doesn't mean average. We can't forget that. And particularly with the benefit of hindsight that courts do not apply, um, it is very easy to point to things that ought to have been done or should have been done that were not. So I wanted to test, um, I wanted to test a couple of things with, with the panel in terms of the way I understand due care and diligence as a very first principles um, concept and then to discuss with you whether or not you think under Canadian law certain um, inaction in relation to climate change is a breach of that duty of due care and diligence. So um, when I teach directors duties you've got to dumb it down, mm -hmm. got to dumb it down. So I talk about the, the five E's of due care and diligence. Um, first of all, the first E is educate. So directors need to have a, a, a core of understanding about what the corporation does, what its financial position is, um, the regulatory environment it operates in and what the broader industry issues that affect the business are. Doesn't really seem very controversial, does it? How much do they need to know? They don't need to be experts, but they need to know what they don't know. This is the known unknowns. Donald Rumsfeld was right. This is the alarm bell knowledge so that they can get to that next E, which is inquire. Might be inquire with an I, but that would ruin my system, so let's just forget that. Um, so they need to educate themselves about what the issues are so that they can then inquire of management and independent experts. Now, I'm a director on the board of a $24 billion superannuation fund, pension fund. My IT knowledge extends to you turn it on and off and then you call help desk. But I know that cyber risk and cyber attack is a huge issue for any company in the financial services industry. And if I'm not getting detailed information from my management about how that risk manifests in the context of our pension fund and what we are doing to address that risk, whose fault is that? The directors. Exactly the same with climate change. How can you deny that it's a material financial issue. It's in the financial press. It's in the Wall Street Journal. It's even on Fox News. <laughs> so you need to then inquire how that impacts on your business. Next D is examine, which means read your board papers and not just at 11 o'clock at night in front of Game of Thrones, which we may or may not all do, um, <laughs> and interrogate them and not just accept the recommendations that you're getting. Fourth E is evaluate, critically evaluate what comes before you, whether it's um, board papers or, or opinions or advice or reports, exercise independent judgment. And the last E is express, which means have an opinion. 
about what comes before you. Now, even when you throw the business judgment rule in, which is courts aren't going to second guess commercial decisions that are made by corporations, that is a substantive defence in terms of if you have done those five E's and you're making a call between different potential commercial alternatives and you know you chose A in good faith after having that robust process of five E's when B actually mm -hmm. turned out to be the way to go, you chose beta instead of VHS. Oh, that's such an old analogy now. Do you guys even know what a video cassette is? <laughs> There's a lot of young people in the room. Um, then, of course, the court isn't going to, to second guess that if you've done your five E's. You need to have the robust process sitting underneath. So my question is, if you are a climate change denier now in Canada, are you discharging your duty of due care and diligence? If you are honestly ignorant about climate change, are you discharging your duty of due care and diligence? If you are not turning your mind to the issue, are you discharging your duty of due care and diligence? If you are just saying, oh, look, we'll deal with it when there's a, a carbon tax, and that's the beginning and the end, are you exercising your duty of due care and diligence? If you are paralysed by the uncertainty, saying, oh, it's all too hard, we'll deal with this in 10 years when the policy situation becomes clearer, are you exercising your duty of due care and diligence? Canadian lawyer to go first and then I'll... Sure. Okay. Well, you, that's a question you want to ask rhetorically but also to anybody, I suppose. Uh, let me just say that I, I, I agree with, you know, what your tests or parameters are for what a corporate director should do in general terms by way of due diligence. But I think the essential question in this area, at least in Ontario, because of the Ontario Environmental Protection Act, is driven by what the law says about emissions and, and directors having a duty to uh, make sure the corporation doesn't discharge contaminants that may cause those adverse impacts. So I think there's a positive duty on directors to focus and to, to accept that, I mean, climate change is recognized as a significant uh, matter by provincial and federal governments. They've got laws about it. And so there's a positive obligation. So they have to recognize that that obligation is there. So the next question is exactly what should the company's overall goal be? And I like what Kristen ended up saying, and I wonder if you can just tell us what the last point in your last slide was that you recommended companies should do. It was yeah, three and the point, alignment. Yeah, to, to get to 1.5 or 2 degrees. You had a specific statement. Can you repeat it? I don't know mm. if you can or not. Um, yeah. Um, I think what I said was that the, and this is one of the direct requests that's being made of Canadian companies in the Philippines, which is to publicize and, and um, publish a plan of how business model is going to be aligned with 1.5. Um, so that's the, the aim of the Paris Agreement. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a very good uh, objective and overall goal for any company. How are your operations and your suppliers' activities and everybody in the chain uh, going to uh, achieve this 1.5 or 2 degree C objective? If you haven't tried to figure that out, you don't have a plan that tries to get you there, and, it, and it, then I think you're missing a basic element of due diligence. I'd like to chime in, because I think, Sarah, you raise a, a really great question in terms of the continuum of where are we yeah. on this particular mm -hmm. issue? What, what do we really expect people to be able mm -hmm. to do and to think about as a regular part of what they are, are, are handling? And it's an amorphous question and a hard one to really come down on because climate change has, is, a, is a big, broad concept. And um, a lot of us, we're not very good at dealing with big, broad concepts. We like dealing with smaller, bite-sized concepts. And some aspects of climate change absolutely have to be discussed and, and addressed. And that is because the board's responsibility is to be forward-looking for what the corporation is going to need to do to survive and thrive mm. um, in the places where it currently operates and the potential places where it could potentially operate. Uh, 
that may or may not align with the um, overall climate change agenda that the world might have, and we wouldn't necessarily expect the corporation to do that under our corporate law regime. Certain aspects are absolutely critical. Compliance with environmental law is a necessity. You, you, you have to just comply. You have to be aware of the standards that are being articulated because those standards articulated in international treaty agreements and the like inform the norms of expected behavior for an organization. Um, and so I think we're on a continuum. We're on a, an evolving um, path here. And I'm not sure that uh, on some aspects, I think it would be quite remiss for a board to ignore or be willfully blind to um, or deny that there's a, an issue to be contend with. And the question then becomes, well, how can we enable directors to do a better job of this? I'm going to put in a, a momentary plug because I love the, the work that they do, but CPA Canada has issued a number of publications focused on what directors need to know and think about on climate change, and that is a particularly useful tool for enabling directors to ask those meaningful questions, to get behind the reports that they're receiving and, and look for the gaps, and to be able to get some comfort that at least their um, questions and their approach are in alignment with where people expect directors to be acting. Could I just have one, one thing yeah. just to end? I think that we're really far from due diligence right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the context that we're working in is that there are companies that are still even funding climate misinformation that are out there, and that's so far from due diligence. And that there are a few examples. Total, for example, has done some of the scenario analysis around a two-degree world. There are, but the where we're at right now to where we need to be is very, very challenging. And so I think that we need to really dive into what is good corporate citizenship. And the one legal angle that I didn't bring into my talk today is the UN, um, business, UN guidelines on business and human rights. Um, and that's been applied in other fields. It hasn't necessarily been applied in context of climate change. We're trying to move that there. But I think we need to go back to those and really consider that as a guideline of moving to good corporate citizenship. Um, and, and, a, and a good place to start is to really working with the Canadian Securities and, uh, Administrator's Review of Corporate Reporting and actively getting involved in that and really considering how we can get some mandatory climate reporting requirements in place and doing that together. I should um, um, admit here that I, I think that the Canadian Supreme Court are a bunch of socialist hippies. <laughs> And actually, the um, best interests of the corporation are purely financial. Um, but the question I would like to ask is when a I... A kinder, gentler nation. Yes. I think the most well said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if the threshold for a board to consider a, a risk issue is whether or not it's foreseeable, because you can't ascertain whether or not it has a material impact until you think about it, for what corporations in which industries is climate change, either in its physical risk manifestation or its economic transition risk manifestation, not a foreseeable risk to a Canadian corporation? Can anyone tell me of an example? Is there any company that doesn't hire people, sell products, use natural resources, pay tax? It's hard. It is hard. And to my mind, there are two issues that are stopping progress on this. And the first is knowledge, because directors just don't understand. They're still looking at this as an environmental issue and not a financial risk. And the second is enforcement. And this is actually a question I wanted to ask you, David, because um, those environmental laws are awesome. Are they being enforced? Why, why, why are not half the directors in Canada in jail now? <laughs> <clears throat> well, that, that uh, obligation that I spoke of in Ontario is, has not been applied to, uh, to climate change specifically, but it's lurking out there, and uh, 
it is uh, something that, you know, can, the government can enforce, or in, uh, in Canada, and maybe even in Australia under British common law that we still have, any citizen can go and ask and, and, and enforce that provision. So Christian could enforce it? Private prosecutions. I've done them. Right. They're done. On the to-do list. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so they're coming. But, but there is, I mean, we have had some history of utilizing uh, environmental laws to hold directors accountable. Um, many years ago, uh, a court denied the ability of a director to rely on their indemnity um, because there had been some contamination in the form of storage of, of um, canisters uh, on the site. This is the, the BATA decision. And uh, at the initial trial level, the, the court said, no, you can't ha be indemnified for the liability you're going to be facing because that would be contrary to public policy mm -hmm. to indemnify you against a quasi-criminal offense. Uh, ultimately, though, the court on appeal um, overturned that decision and concluded that you could be indemnified because the director hadn't breached their fiduciary duty mm -hmm. and, and so indemnification was possible and they were not going to read in the public policy element uh, that the uh, lower court had read in. And then one other instance under environmental legislation, the one that, um, that really um, gets directors nervous was the enforcement action in North Star Aerospace. Mm -hmm where they pursued the directors and former directors and officers of a company that became insolvent. Those individuals had been working diligently to deal with some historical remediation on the site, um, but uh, despite all that effort, um, the company simply just wasn't um, viable and went under, and then the ministry issued an order and uh, at the individuals under the charge management and control authority that they have uh, to issue orders, ask, requiring them to clean up, and ultimately those individuals ended up settling for a large amount of money with the ministry because although they thought that they might be um, able to and successful ultimately in an appeal, the problem was that they'd still be on the hook for what had to have been achieved subject to the order. They couldn't just um, pause, appeal, and then have the order um, rescinded. And so uh, that, was, that was probably the high water mark of actually holding uh, directors accountable, although what was um, offensive about it was that these were people that actually were trying to be mm -hmm. diligent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, uh, in, in the few minutes that we do have left, I'm sure there's plenty of questions uh, for our panellists from the floor. So... Who's not feeling shy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Somewhere. Ah, there we go. Um, and if you could state your, your name and your affiliation before you ask a question too. Lynn Johansson with E2 Management Corporation. Um, <clears throat> There is uh, interest in various jurisdictions in Canada to do a rebalancing of standards, largely voluntary activity, and regulation. What value do you think standards like ISO 14001 for environmental management will have in the scenario where you can go to a company and say, as part of your due diligence, have you adopted these things? And will that make a difference in terms of what you see going forward? Andrew, is that yeah. one of you? So standards, as I alluded to earlier, are, are important because they inform what it is that you'd expect an organization to adhere to. And to the extent that the organization states that it will adhere to a standard and does not, um, there is absolutely a, a, a possibility of being held accountable for that disconnect between what they've promised and what they have actually performed. So there is a, there is a relevance in terms of trying to move the dial on this one in, in adopting standards that are um, uh, that are promoted as being a practice that that organizations should adopt. Um, so. I, I think there is value to doing that. The question then becomes, is it a standard that becomes uh, sufficiently widely adopted or is otherwise meaningful as a reference point for 
the organization or the, or, or the industry that the organization is in? I think the, one of the biggest drivers of standards and improvement will be the financial institutions who are being asked to loan money on future development uh, activities. It was the financial institutions that actually drove the cleanup of, of uh, contaminated land in Ontario because they, having lent money on a property and then see the facility go bankrupt, the Ministry of Environment was targeting them for the deep pockets to clean up the site. They said, no, we're not going to get, we're not going to allow that to happen, certainly in the future. So they insisted that, you know, uh, appropriate testing and, and uh, revelation of potential risks on that property were known before they would loan the money. That's going to become the case, I believe, with financial institutions, insurance companies, and other lenders. They're not, or they better not, for their own sake, lend money in future on any carbon-based activities that, uh, unless they fully assess what they think will be the risks to them. One more question. Free legal advice, come on. Thanks, I'm Dana Scott. I'm a faculty member at Osgoode Hall Law School. Uh, a question for David. Um, and as you know, I'm, I'm paying attention closely recently to the um, journalists that are focusing in on the price of oil investigations on um, the sour gas uh, issue in Saskatchewan and also the uh, petrochemical cluster in Sarnia. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, in Ontario, we haven't seen something like a private prosecution for an adverse effect, and I suspect the issue is related to the difficulty in proving that anyone's emissions in particular are causing that adverse effect. So how do you think we might get to a different outcome on climate change, or how would we overcome that barrier, barrier with respect to a climate change action? Well, very quickly, um, I think the argument would be on the side of the prosecution that any contribution of GHG to the atmosphere that uh, could potentially uh, cumulate uh, with others uh, is something that needs to be uh, dealt with, and it isn't a defense that it's a de minimis uh, uh, contribution or that uh, others are doing it. I mean, we've never accepted that argument in common law that others are doing it. You can still be liable for the nuisance. and. Uh, in Holland and, and even the Supreme Court of the United States rejected the de minimis uh, uh, defense in, in those, those cases. Um, but I think it has to be tied to the identification of what is needed by any corporation to be doing in order to meet the Paris objectives. So that's why I think it's going to be particularly important to figure out what every company, what every emitter should be doing to bring their emissions within uh, the limits that they need to uh, do in, as part of the part of the emission sources, and if they're not doing that, if they've ignored even doing the analysis, I think they're in trouble. Could I just say I think a really good place to look at the, where this is being dealt with um, is in the San Francisco and Oakland complaints. So they're claiming that the companies are jointly and severally liable for causing, creating, and assisting in the creation or contributing to or maintaining the public nuisance. It's a really good section of there. In addition, West Coast Environmental Law Center has a project called Climate Law on Our Hands, and several BC municipalities have sent letters to companies um, asking for their contribution, their fair share towards damages, and they have a really fantastic analysis around how do you attribute responsibility and, and the damages among those companies. Mm. We just go back to Ben's satellite tracking yeah. of these emissions. To say Ben's satellite. <laughs> that is going to be an exciting development. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to my panellists, David, Andrew and Kristen. Um, give them a round of applause and get caffeine. Mm -hmm.